Throughout its four decades or so of rich and plentiful history, two things hip hop has always seemed to be synonymous with is crime and controversy. Likely due to its roots in the lower socioeconomic neighborhoods of urban cities, acting as an outlet of expression for the trials and tribulations of its peoples. Ranging from armed robberies to RICO cases, hip hop is no stranger to gruesome violence all in the name of survival. But one story in particular may be the most disturbing. Seemingly out of a horror film or folktale, but somehow the real stories tend to be more unbelievable than the ones that were written. Such as the petrifying story of horrorcore pioneer turned convicted cannibal, Big Lurch. Born Antron Singleton on September 15, 1976 in East Dallas, Texas, Big Lurch was raised in Fraser Housing Projects. His parents separated while he was young, so he stayed with his mom locally, while his dad moved out of town to Valero, Texas. From an early age, Lurch exhibited a knack for creativity. He started writing poetry at the mere age of seven years old, and progressed to rapping and performing by 15 at local venues in Dallas. During this time of his life, such as his first performance in 1990, he repped the artist and stage name G. Spade. Upon coming of age a few years later, he set out to California for the abundance of opportunity to fully pursue his musical career as countless have in the past and continue to do so to this day, since most country towns, including his own, lacked the interest for entertainment. Big Lurch earned his new stage name from peers due to his imposing but slim stature standing at 6 feet 7 inches, similar to that of the fictional character named Lurch in the moderate horror TV and movie series The Addams Family. It only took a few years to reach the charts for in 1997, Big Lurch featured on RBL Posse's hit single How We Comin' with another artist, Mystical, that landed at 122nd on the US Billboard charts. The single ended up leading the tracklist for the rap group's Eye for an Eye album that released later that year. Around this time, Big Lurch formed the short-lived but semi-successful rap collective in Oakland, Cosmic Slop Shop, with legendary record producer Ricardo Rick Rock Thomas and Marvin Dooney Baby Selman. The hip-hop group only released one album in 1998 called The Family through MCA Records, led by their minor hit single titled Sinful that peaked at number 66 on the US hot R&B and hip-hop songs charts. Though disappointed with the album's lack of undeniable success, the group disbanded to focus on their respective solo careers. In the following two years, Big Lurch would continue to collaborate on songs with some of the most respected MCs on the West Coast at the time, like E-40, Too Short, and Dub C, all the while maintaining the pressure to succeed in his solo discography that predominantly consisted of a new subgenre of rap called horrorcore that centered around the dark fantasies, such as serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer and Hannibal, Vampires, horror characters such as the oh-so-popular Jason from Friday the 13th and Freddy Krueger, and oddly enough, cannibalism. In hindsight, perhaps Big Lurch's lyrics should have been a red flag and or sign of mental instability, but to be fair, a far majority of the subgenre's topics were simply fiction. Eminem and the Insane Clown Posse were some of the most prominent artists that assisted in popularizing horrorcore with their unique expressions of the subject matter. Accompanied by a rather dead period of gangster rap due to recent murders of Tupac and Biggie, the almost novelistic lyrics were captivating a quite strong audience. Big Lurch meshed the two styles well, utilizing metaphors of the fictional characters and events with his real life and environment, drug dealing and gang banging. But even with such big names representing this particular upcoming spin on rap music, Big Lurch still had yet to break out personally in his career to the likes of mainstream recognition. Nonetheless, he still had the potential and had not even officially released his first studio solo project yet. The next century was about to turn, and big things were certainly on the horizon. The year is 2000, and what Big Lurch believed to be his breakout year was upon him. However, it was off to a disastrous start. He would firstly receive news that his grandmother passed away, but soon after, another unrelated event would mark the true beginning of his downfall. On the night of September 15th, Big Lurch was driving home to celebrate his 24th birthday, when suddenly he was rear-ended by a drunk driver. His injuries were catastrophic, 
resulting in a broken neck, typically known as one of the most fatal physical ailments. To alleviate the pain, the hospital sedated him with a cocktail of prescription drugs. And although they were somewhat successful in this endeavor and were able to save his life, of course, it came with a price. The healing process for such a severe injury was slow and agonizing. The prolonged use of prescription drugs caused him vivid hallucinations and a dependence on the painkillers. Big Lurch would then spend the next few months in a rehabilitation center to recover bodily function and cope with the mental and physical anguish. And because of the delays and likely mood swings from the drugs and emotional turmoil, he would soon fall out with his collaborators for the album he had been creating. He decided to move back to Texas for a while to ground himself in the environment he knew best and finally focus on recording and producing his first studio album. But alas, within a short time of arriving, he was arrested for possession of marijuana, which at the time was still highly illegal, as many inmates are still locked up to this day for the same charges. Fortunately, money talks, and his label was able to compensate a lawyer to bail him out and expunge the charges. However, they wanted Lurch back on the West Coast where they could keep him out of trouble, or at least handle further issues if he were to find himself in them again. This move backfired though, for Big Lurch soon became entrenched in the gang culture of Los Angeles where the rivalry between Bloods and Crips reigned supreme. Tension between his collaborators at the recording studios were only intensified due to his associations with the Bloods, whereas they repped the opposite blue flag. The inherent stress of violence drove him to live with other gang members in the dope house where they sold product for easy access to relief. The pain from his broken neck continued to loom. Prior to the major injury, Big Lurch claims he was actually relatively clean. He only admitted to smoking marijuana and hadn't even taken a sip of alcohol prior to the accident. Though reportedly, he was fond of smoking joints dipped in the highly flammable chemical formaldehyde commonly used to embalm dead bodies that apparently gives the user hallucinogenic effects similar to PCP. Eventually, the turn of events led him down an even darker path, if that was even possible, to angel dust. Fensiclidine, or PCP as aforementioned, is the king of dissociative drugs, inducing distortion of sight, sound, and feelings of detachment. Big Lurch would be high for weeks on end forgetting to eat, and falling further and further into his own delusion. Until that fateful day, he earned his rank in infamy. April 19th, 2002. Big Lurch, accompanied by his roommate Thomas Moore, who he met from his time in the music industry, lived in Southeast Los Angeles alongside with his 21-year-old girlfriend, Tynesha. On that night, Lurch, Thomas, and other friends smoked PCP at the apartment. Fortunately, Tynesha wasn't home when they started, for Lurch had apparently surpassed his limits with the drug and blacked out. In the documentary Rhyme and Punishment, Lurch explained, They just kept feeding it to me. The next thing I remember is I woke up in jail with a murder. For approximately two weeks later, he finally regained consciousness, unknowingly awaiting a sentence for a myriad of severe felonies. According to reports, on the afternoon of April 20th, the day after they last smoked the PCP, Big Lurch started to experience incredible agony as the pain-killing effects of the drug began wearing off. He panicked and rushed back to the apartment in search of more. When he arrived, a group of people were still there though, except something was off. Big Lurch felt a dark and demonic presence in the room, more specifically, in the stomach of Thomas's girlfriend, Tynesha. He had to save everyone. Big Lurch then ordered everyone to leave except for Tynesha, whose physical human body could not stand a chance against Big Lurch's monstrous physique. Once they were completely alone, Lurch brutally attacked her, ridding her and the world of any satanic energy. To seal the deal, he found a knife from the kitchen and plunged it deep into her heart repeatedly, rendering her lifeless. Although the job wasn't finished, as the demon could still be lurking inside her body. He then carves open her stomach to halt the demon's incubation and progresses up her abdomen to pull out one of her lungs. Finally, he gnaws on her freshly pumping raw organ flesh. Tanisha's autopsy later revealed bite marks on her lungs and face to confirm the story. 
Not to mention, a medical examination concluded Big Lurch's stomach contained human flesh and blood that was not his own. Testimony stated that afterwards he stormed outside into the streets completely nude. Their neighbor and close friend of Tynesha, Elisa Allen, witnessed the abomination of gushing red blood covering Lurch's entire body and investigated inside and discovered Tynesha's lifeless corpse lying on the floor soon after calling the cops. Police rushed over to find Big Lurch running the streets naked, spattered with blood, growling like a wild animal, all the while grasping Tynesha's right lung firmly in his hand and staring up into the sky. The coroner's report of the catastrophe was horrifying to say the least. Even in comparison to the countless other gruesome investigations that accompany the job title, the report discovered numerous stab wounds, broken neck and jaw, fractured eye socket, and of course, a missing lung from Tynesha's body. On the other hand, Big Lurch's extensive medical examinations resulted in a likely PCP-induced psychosis, essentially causing his mind to perceive reality in a much different way than those around him temporarily. They also found the antipsychotic prescription drug Halapridol used to treat nervous, emotional, and mental conditions such as schizophrenia and Tourette syndrome in his blood. Due to the insane evidence stacked against him and frankly, almost unbelievable actions straight out of a horror movie, his lawyer Milton Grimes, who also acted as the owner of his record label, Black Market Records, advised him to support all the horrific details in order to strengthen the case for a plea of insanity, which would in turn lessen his sentence and place him in a psychiatric hospital instead of prison where he was likely facing life. Milton famously represented Rodney King in the successful case against the city of Los Angeles for police brutality. However, he did not necessarily have the perfect reputation. In 2004, Grimes was accused of malpractice in regards to the mother of a shooting victim, in which he was ordered to pay her $1.2 million for improper litigation. Regardless, the trial commenced. Big Lurch maintains that he has no recollection of what transpired as he was intoxicated from PCP among other drugs. However, in California, such information doesn't help his case in the slightest, since state precedent does not consider voluntary drug use as a condition for temporary insanity, unless the defendant has a well-documented history of mental illness. Luckily, he actually did have an extensive record, including two hospitalizations for bipolar disorder. But for some reason, his lawyer refused to bring up the significant information leaving Big Lurch with debilitated attempts to sway the jury's opinion, such as pit bulls, one of the more muscular and violent breeds of canine, if raised improperly, and typically bred for dogfighting, being present at the scene of the crime. Lurch exclaimed that detectives should have confirmed that the bite marks on Tynesha's flesh derived from, in fact, human teeth. All he needed to prove was that there was a possibility that he did not commit such heinous crimes to be free. But as we discussed, medical examinations corroborated the claims. And even worse yet, some of his most deranged lyrics from his horrorcore unreleased music were also used in the trial by the prosecution, such as the track, I Did It To You. They're released on the album two years following the incident, but after the trial. The song describes a past, likely fictional, unforgivable story of how he murdered his mailman. Late in the afternoon, the mailman was delivering, so I threw him in my house, slit his throat, and left him shivering. Among many other fictional scenarios that he admits to. How and why was an unreleased track used as evidence in a pending trial, you may ask? Well, someone must have had an ulterior motive. Big Lurch's trial was set for June 13th, 2003, in the Compton, Los Angeles County Superior Court. Unsurprisingly, the jury found him guilty of all counts within an hour of deliberation, including first-degree murder, torture, and aggravated mayhem. Lurch was sentenced to life in prison without parole. But less than one year following the conviction, on March 14th, 2004, unbeknownst to Big Lurch, I might add, his record label released his debut studio album titled All Bad, accompanied by a documentary titled Drugs Made Me Do It Thereafter, likely a sensationalized marketing campaign to sell more records and capitalize from the horrifying incident. Perhaps this was his lawyer and record label owner, if you recall, Milton's plan all along keep Big Lurch locked up for the rest of his life so that Black Market Records had full control over his discography. 
and more importantly, its revenue. Although, I can imagine the legal fees would have been a hefty toll, so maybe Milton was paying himself back for the effort. While the evidence of the gruesome events that took place seemed like an open and shut case against Lurch, for some reason, the mother of the victim, Tynesha, actually went on record claiming that she did not believe Big Lurch was the perpetrator. In fact, in the 2011 Rhyme and Punishment documentary detailing the tragedy, Caroline Stinson explained instead that she believed Big Lurch was high on PCP, but that Tynesha was already dead by the time he arrived to the apartment. He simply ate one of her lungs off the floor, thinking it was food. Her mother further stated that Tynesha's ex-boyfriend, Forrest, may have been responsible for such heinous acts and simply framed Big Lurch out of convenience. Apparently, Forrest was abusive in the past, and coincidentally, Tynesha had plans on the exact day of her murder to permanently sever ties with him. According to medical reports, Tynesha also suffered a neck injury prior to her mutilation, found to be caused by a children's scooter with a bloody handprint that was not Big Lurch's. Tynesha's system was also found to contain excessive PCP, an impossible amount to have entered through only smoking. Her mother believes the drug was forcefully poured down her throat. Conveniently, none of this was mentioned in the trial. Other evidence that failed to be utilized to prove Big Lurch's innocence included bloody fingerprints on doors, footprints in a shoe at the back entrance, none of which matched Big Lurch's DNA. Tanisha's mother believed the condition of her daughter's body was a result of a killer with true hateful intent, not a drug-induced senseless rampage. Several years after the case closed, she attempted to sue Big Lurch's record label owner, Milton Grimes, for encouraging his negligent behavior of excessive drug use in order to better resemble a gangster rap image and sell more records. If her mother's theories are at all correct, Tanisha's relationship with Big Lurch's friend and roommate Thomas Moore might not have been true either, all just part of the cover-up. Following the verdict, Big Lurch grew suspicious of Milton Grimes. Despite his past large successes, Big Lurch believed his lawyer lost the case on purpose. One of his multiple theories explored the fact that he and Milton represented opposing gang ties, causing issues for a few months leading up to the murder. As aforementioned, Big Lurch was, in fact, having issues recording his debut project before heading off to Texas due to falling out with collaborators. Perhaps there was correlation with the potential malpractice. Another theory hypothesized that Milton represented arguments and evidence in such a way to gain favor for another related case, although little evidence supports this claim. Regardless, there is definitely a real possibility of foul play, considering the unidentified evidence at trial and the conflict of interest with respect to Milton's specific professional relationships with Big Lurch. As it substantially benefited Milton, as the black market records owner, for one of his lead artists to be sentenced to life in prison. Not only was his story a highly engaging headline that was bound to sell more copies of his album, but also with Big Lurch rotting behind bars for eternity, there was no one to collect his royalties. At least, very easily. Further supported by Tanisha's mother's lawsuit arguing that his label encouraged negligent behavior such as drug use and gang activity. Besides, how did the prosecution acquire unreleased music files to use as evidence against him if it wasn't Milton? Nonetheless, at this point in time, the case has long been decided, and no one will ever truly know what actually happened that day. Other than, of course, if Tynesha's ex-boyfriend, Forrest, was the perpetrator. But it definitely would not have hurt Big Lurch's case to examine the unidentified finger and footprints at the scene of the crime to provide some sort of reasonable doubt to the jury. Though, it would still be difficult to look past pieces of Tynesha's lung being discovered in Big Lurch's stomach as well as finding him in the middle of public transit covered in blood completely naked and of course, growling at officers. Big Lurch remains in California State Prison where he continues to serve his life sentence, meanwhile appealing the jury's decision to be denied over and over. According to reports, he was placed in solitary confinement three to four years in a row. The inmates do not treat him as if he were a human, being known as a cannibal who killed and consumed parts of a young woman. Now that he's been rehabilitated through the penitentiary system, Big Lurch heavily opposes drugs, speaking against them in an interview with DJ Vlad. But overall, despite his situation, he seems to be in incredibly good spirits. 
He has significantly strengthened his relationship with God through worship and independently studies law in the hopes that he can maneuver himself out of the life sentence, or at the very least, be awarded a retrial to utilize the evidence left out of the original hearing. Big Lurch frequently writes his fans and is thankful to even have them still. But regardless of what actually happened, it is no surprise that the case fell out of his favor due to the culmination of poor coherent decisions he made for himself throughout his life and career. The excessive drug use, gang affiliations, and quite frankly, his dark-spirited lyrics. In many states, lyrics are still used to this day to prove hip-hop artists especially of crimes in their community regardless if it was fiction or not. Anyone interested in the horrorcore rap subgenre should be weary of the assumptions that could be made upon your character. But what do you think is next for Big Lurch? Will he succeed in his attempts to appeal a retrial for his first degree murder case? And better yet, be freed after all these years? Will new evidence be discovered to prove his innocence? Or was the jury right all along? That he was a lunatic cannibal rapper that ate a poor young lady's flesh in a drug-fueled tirade. And with that, I bid you all adieu. Make sure to like and subscribe for more rap conspiracy breakdowns, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Peace.